And th she said those are major changes. Well, MS, I mean, it's, it's scarring, you know, on the outside mm -hmm. of the spinal cord. Yes. So the head slips off a little bit, and it's just this little bit of rubbing going mm -hmm. on and on. What's going to happen? You're going to get some scarring there. Mm -hmm. And so what do you think? It was at birth, maybe, a difficult birth, yes. and that bone slipped out yes. of place, That's and yes. things just never were birth. right? And you'd yes. think that the birth would have been just out of the normal canal, but this birth had been a cesarean. Right, and, and they think that nothing could have gone they think wrong. Nothing but, go wrong. But it's normal. To, but you have to, for a normal birth, you have to go through that for everything yes. to set the stage. Mm -hmm. Well, if you can imagine the trauma that goes on as you're pulling that baby's head, and these two little guys sitting down here that are trying to do their work mm -hmm. gets locked out of place. It means that from the very beginning, you could first have breath. the first breath could begin yeah. starting disease of some sort simply because something's blocked. We're designed for, to let our head talk to our body right. or our body talk to our head and let it answer back. And if, but if the communication's cut Right, off, it's just like that cable's bent a little bit, mm -hmm. so the information's mm -hmm. not going through and the information through, like if you took a wire to your TV and bent it a little bit, yes. it's, maybe you can see a picture, but it's kind of fuzzy, you know, mm -hmm. it's just not right. Mm -mm. Yes. Not so what are the, so some of the other things? Well, these are just some of the things. Now, this is over that 1,500 patients <laughs> okay. that Rhonda and this CA, they became buddies and talking all the time. She mentioned bedwetting. Bedwetting, yeah, okay. Bedwetting, MS. Depression. Now, who'd think depression? Well, it's kind of uh, which came first, the chicken or the egg. I mean, when you have all these other mm -hmm. problems, you got a right to be a little depressed. Got a right to be depressed, absolutely. Sinus infection, uh, ear infections, where usually mm -hmm. you take the child in to have tubes put in their ears. You know, that makes a lot of sense, tubes in the ears. After to get multiple it. rounds of After antibiotics. After multiple rounds. Well, this, yeah. this bone yes. right here is, is right here. Right below, yes. Right there. So what's here? You know, you've got the ear right there, and there's that little tube from the middle ear that mm -hmm. can get pushed on and blocked, mm -hmm. so the, the ear won't, you know. So you Thank can, you by, by moving the atlas and opening that natural tube up, you don't have to get artificial to, tubes but, put in, you know. No. But if the physician doesn't know that and doesn't understand the placement of that bone blocking that up, it is normal to put a tube in there to open it up to allow them. The problem is they don't know. They don't know that by simply moving that, it opens up and it goes. Yeah. Listen, so like what, what, TMJ maybe, right here. What about what else is right there? Your jaw. What else? Yeah, mm -hmm. your jaw. Me, try to right. arouse you. Facial him. nerve. Yeah, facial nerve. And it was difficult once that doctor began to explain to me truly what was going on. I thought, how in the world, that bone is below my trigeminal neuralgia. How could that possibly? Right, cause but that's where the origin of that nerve, yes, that's where it exactly. starts, is yes. inside of Alice. It all and, starts and, there. And the yes. vagus nerve that goes down uh, to your intestines, mm -hmm. irritable bowel syndrome, mm -hmm. very oh. often caused mm -hmm. by this. Nothing that's wrong in the stomach itself. No. Allergy relief. Oh, I hear that all the time. <laughs> all the time. People don't even tell you they have allergies. They come in and they go, I don't have to use my inhaler anymore. Yeah. Yes. How about this? ADD and HDD. I heard something on the radio on the way to work where some of the new research showed that the children diagnosed with that aren't getting quite as much blood to mm -hmm. their brain as other children. Mm -hmm. But they didn't take it a step further as to why aren't they? Well, you get this yes. kink in the upper neck, the vertebral yes. arteries are right there. They get just a little bit pushed on. And I'm not talking about 50%, it's only mm -hmm. like, they found it like two or 4% reduction. Mm -hmm. But over time, it causes okay. problems. You bet. It's amazing, just being, a, they're, they're very small bones. Mm -hmm. Somebody said they lay way, way less than like an ounce or two. I mean, just really small. But yet, inside those two is truly our CPU unit for the computer. Right. So that's why sometimes people tell me, you know, all the changes that happen afterwards, like rebooting the computer. Yes. Yeah. Which Good is example. happening. And I love what you said about that rubbing against it. One of the doctors told us on an overseas trip uh, with some of the doctors that when that bone is moved over and that, that uh, is moving, the brain stem keeps rubbing, he says the longer it rubs against one of those bones, the more callous it gets. Yeah, I mean, that feels good. But if you did that for years. How about oh, 10 years? You know, 12 years. What a mess. What a mess. Mm. And he says, now you stop rubbing it. 
do you think it's going to be just like the other side is? <laughs> you know, I think it's about time that we gave somebody from uh, the guests out here a chance to ask questions or make oh, comments. Does anybody, does anybody um, have any questions in the audience about what we've talked about so far or would like to make any kind of a comment? Just raise your hand if you do. We need a camera. Mm -hmm. Sue, Dave. <laughs> Sue. Hi. How are you today? Good, how are you guys? Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Um, I also suffer from trigeminal neuralgia. Do you? Yes. Okay. And I was wondering, so, um, do you still go for treatment doing this? Or did it, was it like a <laughs> one, two, three, it's done? Or? Here, good question. Yeah, that yeah, is an extremely is. good question. Because right now I'm on medication for it right now. And it's, okay. it's working OK. I mean, it yeah. does, you know. Mm -hmm. But sometimes it's the same thing. It comes and it goes, very extreme pain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But when I heard this, or my husband actually heard it, he's like, turn mm -hmm. the radio on. You know, this guy's talking about Trigem, you know, Tia. And mm -hmm. So yeah. that's why I came. And I was wondering about your treatment and how, um, yeah. do you still go follow-ups? Did it, I mean, how many treatments did it take for you to get better? And Here's the wonderful thing, Sue, that I found out about it. My wife and I both. This is, a, a, it's a life change. It's a, it's like, we got a nice car here. Keep it in working order. Don't just drive it even though the light comes on. My light that came on saying I had engine trouble was this trigeminal neuralgia. When the doctor corrected it and allowed it to begin to heal itself, it was fine provided they stayed together and did that. But it had been years and my muscles and body structure didn't want those to be there. Mm -hmm. They'd pull them out pretty easily. So at the beginning, I had to go as often as she said. Sometimes I'd go. She'd look at me and say, oh, no, you're OK. Mm -hmm. I'd say, yeah, but aren't you going to adjust me? She said, no, I don't mm -hmm. need to. You're OK. I'd say, but I'm still feeling. She said, I know. That's, that's the way to find, know that you've got a good chiropractor, where they mm -hmm. don't feel like they have to do something every time that you show up, because less that. is more. You, it's the old timers yes. that use this method I talked to. They discussed it as like picking fruit when it's ripe. When you need the adjustment, that's when yes. you want to do it. Yes. Good, but it takes someone with experience that can see that that fruit is ripe. And that's what she did. So she would check until finally it stayed in long enough and the pain started to go away long enough that I felt that I had been cured. And coming out of the words of her mouth, two years later, she told me, she says, James, I don't know if, if trigeminal neuralgia is cured or not. She says, because I don't do the curing. I don't know that. But your symptoms of pain, they're gone. It's okay. finished. Mm -hmm. I prefer I've, like saying it's under control or something. Uh, and yes. I yeah. use the yes. word very cautiously, the word cure. Yes. Yeah, sure. If you ever see an ad on the internet that says, I cure this, that's uh, the, maybe not the one that you want to call. <laughs> I'm too good to be true. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Go ahead. Well, it's, it's true. It, but the symptom, which is bothering you and I and, and your daughter-in-law, what's bothering us was the pain was, and, and it progressively gets worse, as you know. So I was happy, not cured or cured, it didn't matter. Is the pain gone? Yes. Now, it's called a maintenance program. Right. This is oh. 10 years have gone by. I, I do know if I'm out quickly because I start getting these spikes up in my face and I know I need to be checked. But I also have learned that just because they're not spiking or doing it, I still need to come back as I remember to go in and say, would you check me? Mm -hmm. you, you begin to build a relationship with your doctor anyway, and they become great friends of yours because they've done. Plus, you've been bringing in lots of people. In fact, you walk in in the, in the waiting room, there's friends there's of yours or friends of friends of yours. So it's kind of like a family thing. You're there. But they do check. And sometimes I am out, even though I don't have a pain. But it's done. But let me give you just some of the benefits that happen by doing that and keeping this kind of a rapport. I found I had suffered for years from ingrown toenails. And I just took that as, that's part of my life. That's the way I was designed. Except when the doctor got me balanced and my body truly began to heal itself, it looked at those ingrown toenails that were going into my flesh and it just straightened them out. My allergies, I couldn't be around cats. Love cats, but please don't bring them in the house. And if Rhonda or one of the daughters were going to spend the night or be with people with cats, please take your clothes off somewhere and leave them, but don't bring them back in here with me. I can't take it. Mm -hmm. We have cats. 
things that I just took that that's just me, that's the way I was born. Well, Learn to live with it. Learn to live with it. <laughs> but, but I just thought, I'm 5'8", I'm I've got brown eyes. That's normal. I, of course, I've got allergy, I've got asthma, I've got uh, hay fever, I don't have to mow the lawn. I've had people before, and I've offered to check them, and maybe at a health fair or something, they're like, well, there's nothing wrong with me. Uh -huh. But they, they have nothing to compare their state of health with. Exactly. I mean, it's not just being sick. Maybe they don't know like how good they could possibly feel if everything was aligned yeah. correctly. I'd like to respond to you also, Sue. It took three corrections for James in nine days, and he was pain-free for 13 months. Okay. After 13 months, the pain returned, and we thought, oh no, is this a fluke? When we went back, the doctor showed us the x-rays, and because James's neck had curved so far forward to support the head, they said it'll take three to three and a half years for the curvature to come back. To come to back. back. Yeah. And once that happens, he, he should hold his correction. So on and off over that next three to three and a half years, he did have to go back because the spikes would return. Mm -hmm. But as soon as he was corrected, they'd leave. That's a lot better deal. Right. Well, at, since that time, after that three years, the only times that he has had pain is once when we had a pretty bad car wreck, somebody hit us, and once he hit his head on the shelves in somebody's garage mm. and knocked himself out. Otherwise, he has no pain. And it stops immediately when he goes to the um, upper cervical On the cervical average, doctor. I would say like a month to six weeks to get a serious condition under control. Okay. And then maintenance mm -hmm. is different with everybody because right. the problem right. is different with everybody. Yes. And it also depends what your health habits are, or what you're eating right. and so forth, your attitude, whether you exercise. Uh, but I have a lot of patients that after coming once a week for six weeks, it gets under control. They come every couple of months, or I have quite a few that only come like every six months, like going to the dentist. But there are others that have to come every couple of weeks because mm -hmm. they, maybe they had a trauma that really did some permanent damage. Well, can I ask you, doctor, have you had patients for TN? Yeah, tried I, I've them? had a few, and all of them got it under control. Did they? Okay. Um, had a young gal that was failing. Um, college because she was falling asleep in class because she was taking barbiturates for the pain. And, you know, I remember when she first came in, brought in by her parents, she fell asleep in the waiting room. We had trouble waking her up. She was so heavily, you know, sedated. And in about a month or six weeks, we got her off all of the medications. She went back to school, graduated. She's working now. Good. Well, thank you very much. Thank oh, you. Sue, thank you. Super and question. I speak blessings on you, by the way, and, and <laughs> thanks for following your spirit. You've come to the right place. Thank you. And yeah. healing is but an arm's reach away. But I know, you know, when I listen to you, I'm like, oh, God. <laughs> I know what that's like. <laughs> yeah. So. yeah. Well, we'll do a little demonstration here in a few minutes. Um, on the table, of, there's different, different doctors use different techniques. I do one that's called a leg check, and I'm looking to see if imbalances, and I'm actually checking the upper neck, but I'm looking at the legs, and we'll, we'll demonstrate that in just a few minutes, but we could take another question first. Dave, you have one? Yeah, I do. You, you <laughs> talked about the uh, lump or mm -hmm. knot in your neck. I, I've had one for years, and wow. you go to different doctors, and you get different diagnosis, and they'll tell you, you know, go to therapy, you go through that, do exercises, and of course, no success, and I've tried chiropractors and you hear snap, crackle, pop, and <laughs> yes. you leave there with a pounding headache, and you think, yes. okay, I'll go try this maybe one more time, and they do it again, and you get the same headache, and yeah. so you learn to live with it. Mm. Yeah. It's, it's, it's always there. It's, it comes and goes to severing, you know, different severities, and you're saying that that's something based on that alignment. Uh, usually when you have a lump like that, you got some sort of trauma, that knock that bone out of place badly enough that there's some inflammation in that area, mm -hmm. and that's what's making the, the, the lump. And over, you know, a few weeks after that's aligned better, um, that swelling will go down mm -hmm. and the symptoms will go away. Because they've tried the, you know, the different uh, anti-inflammatories, and, and mm -hmm. there's, there's a certain amount of success, but it always comes back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, those just mask mm -hmm. the symptoms. They don't correct mm -hmm. the problem. Yeah. And it's, it's, I mean, the success rate on all of these different things, more than nine out of 10. And of course, I don't know when somebody comes in if they're gonna be one that, that for some reason there's something else going on that, that it can't be helped or, you know. But more than nine out of 10 people get the problem under control. Some people use the word cure, I don't. Yeah. Um, okay. So, uh, got the message here, it's time to, we're gonna take a short break and when we come back, we're gonna do a demonstration on the table here. 
and uh, we can answer a few more questions at that time. So stick around. Thanks. Welcome back, folks. I'm Dr. Mike, and this is Health Talk. Today we have James and Rhonda Tomasi, our guests. Uh, wrote the book, What Time Tuesday? Uh, you can find out more information on my website, www.burkonchiropractic.com. That's B-U-R-C-O-N. Or call 616-575-9990. Now we were talking on the break a little bit about that first chiropractic adjustment that happened in 1895. And actually what D.D. D. Palmer found was a lump on the back of uh, Harvey Lillard's neck, his janitor's neck, and he was doing something called magnetic healing. Mm -hmm. Now magnetic healing has had somewhat of a comeback in the last few years, but in 1895 it was the main thing people went to to get well because MDs, the only thing they did then was bloodletting. They would cut you or burn you and put a little cup on there to suck blood out or actually, like you said, mm -hmm. use leeches. Mm -hmm. So they weren't real popular back then. That, that wasn't really, people didn't like going to the MD. So uh, DD in examining uh, Mr. Lillard found a bump on the back of his neck that just didn't seem normal, did some studying, thought it was disarticulated C2 axis, the second cervical vertebra, this one, the no bone, pushed it back into place, and lo and behold, Harvey Lillard, who was deaf, his hearing came back. So he thought he discovered a cure for deafness got all these uh, people in that couldn't hear and nobody else got their hearing back. But they started noticing that other things started to improve. So he knew he was onto something and that's when they started doing the research. Wow. So uh, what I would like to do now is a sample of how I check for an upper cervical subluxation. It's called a leg check. We talk about a short leg. The leg isn't really shorter than the other one. There's a twist in the spine somewhere, and we do a series of tests to decide, well, where is that? And then we x-ray that area and determine what type of a listing of misalignment, and then we push that back. So we're going to move over to the table over here, and Rhonda, I'm going to ask you to go face down on here, and all you have to do is relax. <laughs> Uh, if you leave your shoes on, it's actually easier for me because I can compare where the, the sole meets the heel called the welt. So I'm guessing when you get checked that typically when you are subluxated, when you have a pinched nerve that's causing a problem, that your left leg goes short. Do you know? Yes. Okay. So now just gently, slowly, carefully turn your head to the right and then turn to the left and back to the center. Now the surest sign of an upper cervical subluxation is when you turn your head, oop, we lost a shoe. Um, the legs will actually change length. They don't always, but that's a sure sign. Hers didn't, cha didn't change very much, so you probably didn't see it on the overhead camera. We'll just make them the same and take the other one off. But we have other ways to check. Gently and steadily pick both feet up towards the ceiling. Relax. So it's a little bit short on the left. That would be a positive test. Of course, like everything in medical, the words are backwards. Positive is bad. It means something's pinched in her, in her neck. And that was a test for Atlas, the top cervical vertebra, which is way up high, higher than most people would guess. So I kind of push off to one side and then check to see whether it makes it better or worse. That didn't change much. And that one, that one did. So it appears, and I would like to have an x-ray to confirm that, that that bone has gone to the left. Um, gently pull your feet together. 
relax. Now this is for the next bone down. It's also out of place a bit. And we can go through and check every bone in the neck this way. Mm -hmm. But the next one that really shows whether somebody has whiplash, uh, a C5 test for the lower cervicals to see whether she has a curve in her neck, a healthy curve. Uh, put your arms out straight at your sides like airplane wings. Now lift your arms up towards the ceiling. Relax. So if you get that on the overhead, you'll see now her left leg is really, really shorter than her right. It's a very strong test. It's over an inch, and that is a positive test for whiplash, something down lower in the neck, which some upper cervical chiropractors adjust the lower neck, and, and some don't. I actually do if the problem persists after the upper cervicals are cleared out. So when I push on the lower neck, put that bone a little closer to where it belongs, it takes some nerve pressure off, and you'll see here now, if you look, that her legs are exactly the same length. I can see that. Doctor. So she's, she's needing an adjustment. Yes. Yes. So Rhonda, you can go ahead and get up. Thanks for being a good sport. We got about five minutes left. Would one other person like to get checked? You're gonna, I might take my shoes. I'm dragging a microphone around here, so I'm a little bit, <laughs> a little bit shackled here. Okay, Dave, come on up. Come on, Dave. Okay, here. Tight quarters, but that's okay. Still works. Okay, can anybody see which leg is short? Uh, which one? The right one. The right one is about half inch, a little bit more short. Turn your head to the right, please. Goes even shorter. Turn your head to the left. Balances out. Did anybody, can you see that? That's a cervical syndrome. So let's do that once more. Slowly turn your head to the right and then to the left. Didn't show up as much this time. But that's okay, that'll happen. Back to, the, back to the center. That's a cervical syndrome, and that's a good one. It's a bad one. <laughs> <laughs> it shows up well. In, indicates a bad problem in the upper cervicals. Uh, actually, that test was, by, was developed by a woman, D.O., in 1945, and it's never been disproven. Nobody's ever come up with a reason why, while you're lying down outside the effects of gravity and you turn your head, any other reason your legs would change lengths unless you get a big pinch up here. Okay. Gently and steadily pick up both feet. Relax. Gently pull your feet together. That's good. So it goes a little more short on the second test. So I think it's probably his major subluxation is axis, not atlas, the second cervical. But we would need uh, an x-ray to be sure. Put your arms out straight at your sides like airplane wings and steadily lift up and relax. So that's a little bit off. So that indicates some whiplash. So he has an upper and a lower cervical subluxation. Um, and he told me during the break that he gets uh, migraines, which is a very common problem with this. So you're all set. You can go ahead and get up. And we're running out of time here. So we've got to wrap things up because the next show's coming in here. Uh, so closing remarks, James, any? Well, I'm just, if, if I have any regrets at all, doctor, is, is that I was just ignorant. My wife and I did not know that you and what you do existed. I would not have suffered 12 solid years with trigeminal neuralgia had I known that there was a way out of this pain. But now that you know you're doing the right thing, you're telling other people. Yes. Well, because people will tell me, wow, this is great at work. I'm like, I'm glad it worked for you. Don't, don't tell me. I know that it usually works. <laughs> tell everybody else that you know. Yes. Well, that's been our dedication for the last 10 years. And I, I personally appreciate it. Well, we appreciate you. I, I know you're not looking for accolades. I know what you're looking for is you'd like to get people well. Get sick people well. Get sick people well. Without well, drugs and surgery. Without drugs and surgery. Well, our, our, we're heart filled, grateful. Thank you very much. For and the, the Tabasis traveled here at their own expense. They don't uh, make any profit off of doing this. They're just trying to help other people feel better. Yeah. 
So that's it for Health Talk. Thanks for joining us. We appreciate it. as you may have heard, the Academy of Chiropractic Philosophers, um, people that are working towards the diplomate status or certification in philosophy. Next speaker is Dr. Mike Burkhorn, Michael Burkhorn from, uh, from Michigan, right? Yes. Yeah. And um, the, um, the BJ of Davenport epigram that I chose for him, it is. Early to bed, early to rise, work like hell and advertise. <laughs> Makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. BJ <laughs> And Mike is, uh, he's really out there in terms of a presence on the web. And, um, and he's making an impact with his work, um, especially in the USA and probably around the world as well. Dr. Bacon is the only doctor who has presented at every international many years seminar over the past seven years. While attending Sherman College of Chiropractic, he restored the electroencephaloneuromian timograph, used it for pattern analysis on patients in student clinics, and published an article about it in the Journal of Chiropractic Economics. Dr. Burkhorn designed the medical computer system for NASA's International Space Station and developed the first chiropractic board game called The Board. <laughs> he authored the only published peer-reviewed paper by a chiropractor on trigeminal neuralgia, and his Menier's paper appears in Upper Surgical Subluxation Complex, a review of the chiropractic and medical literature. Dr. Birkhoff was particularly honored by his Above and Beyond Award for volunteering his chiropractic services at Ground Zero. So please welcome Dr. Michael Birkhoff. I wanted to come to New Zealand for 40 years. I kind of given up on making it. So I was very enthusiastic when I got invited. Thank you for having me. Uh, so I read books and my wife, Jane, said, uh, this isn't fair, you're gonna know all about where we're going, I won't know. And I said, well, that's not a problem, I'll just make up a game so you can learn it. So this is my game I made up about New Zealand. So we started in Grand Rapids, went to Denver, San Francisco, Auckland, flew to Christchurch, took the train to Greymouth. That's where I got interested. There was a flood, so they canceled our bus, so we hitchhiked <laughs> to uh, Nelson and uh, took the bus over to Picton, the ferry to Wellington, flew to Rotorua, and I took the bus yesterday to Auckland. So we arrived one week ago today. So Prosper Vignier was a medical doctor and France, ran the Death Institute, and he had a 14-year-old girl that had all of these strange symptoms. He wrote a paper on it, and they named the disease, which is really a syndrome, Meniere's after him. And the interesting thing is, is uh, medical doctors decided to exhume the body, and they tested her. Of course, there was just some bone fragments left, and it turned out that she had cancerous tumor in the ear. So the very first Meniere's patient was misdiagnosed. <laughs> <laughs> so medically, uh, it's not like if you have a particular disease and they do a blood test and go, ah, we found it. It's a subjective diagnosis by <coughs> exclusion of everything else. So they will do blood tests. They will do an MRI in the United States. An MRI costs fifteen hundred dollars. Uh, they test for hearing loss. Uh, technically, the hearing loss is supposed to be in the lower decibels. Uh, they'll blow hot and cold air and water into the ear, watch the eyes flutter, and sometimes the patient begins vomiting. They'll stick a needle through the eardrum and put in electrical impulses and graph it. Uh, and one of the interesting things is that they came up with a VEMP test where they'll stick needles into the sternocleidal mastomuscle and, and they'll find out that when they turn their head, 
actually they get strange signals. And I told them, you can do uh, this test by just looking at the legs. You don't have to stick needles into the uh, flesh. <clears throat> so to be diagnosed with Meniere's disease, you have to have at least two episodes of uh, unexplained vertigo. Vertigo is much worse than dizziness. It usually includes nausea and vomiting. Uh, some patients have drop attacks where they just fall to the floor and can't get up. They have to be picked up. And they have hearing loss. And they have either 